is created by the GVSU Film and Video Production Alumni Chapter. It's a live conversation where alumni can share stories about their career path, about working in their part of the industry, and it's where we can share some advice to you. This episode is about writing for television, and I'm really excited to welcome Jeremy Howe and George Kitson from LA this afternoon. So welcome, Jeremy and George. Thank you. Hello. So I'm wondering if we could just take a moment and everyone just do a brief introduction into your background and kind of landing on what you're working on these days. So George, would you like to start? Sure. Uh, yeah. So George Kitson, uh, I graduated from Grand Valley in 2004 and moved out to Los Angeles pretty soon after. Uh, I worked in production for a long time as a PA and eventually transitioned into a writer's uh, assistant job and uh, did that for a few seasons on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and uh, eventually was staffed as a writer and was a writer for three seasons on that show and went on to another show after that. And uh, yeah, that's that's kind of where I am now. Great. And Jeremy, how about you? Uh, similar, actually. I graduated in 2002. Um, and actually, my last credits were an internship at the Young and the Restless uh, soap opera out here in January of 2002. And got did that briefly, got stuck in the CBS mailroom for three years. Um, but there met an executive who got me a PA job on a sitcom uh, called Out of Practice, which was on CBS. And from there, became a writer's uh, PA on an, another show called The Game, um, wrote a freelance episode there, and then that got canceled, then just hopped around to some other shows, uh, eventually becoming the writer's assistant on um, uh, The Big Bang Theory, uh, halfway through season four. And then halfway through season six, got promoted to staff writer um, and rode that out to the end of the that series, which went 12 seasons. Um, and then actually the last two seasons, I was doing both that show and uh, Young Sheldon, um, which uh, the, this kind of spinoff prequel of that. And that was then season three of Young Sheldon was there full time. Uh, and we're just literally today wrapping um, season four uh, for that. So that's what I am doing. Awesome. Well, I feel like we're going to have a lot to dig into, into kind of the specifics of how you got to those, both of those places. So that's, that's great. Um, I'll do a brief introduction. I graduated in 2000 and promptly moved to Wilmington, North Carolina, which back in 2000 was the third largest film hub after LA and New York, which is no longer true. Um, and lived there about a year and a half before moving to LA for about a decade and worked mostly in extras casting and as a grip, um, but also kind of was all over the place. So production assistant, art department, set lighting, uh, before I moved back to Michigan about a decade ago. And so now I work as a writer, editor, and book coach and podcast host as well. So I have a writing podcast. So I'm excited to get a little bit more of a behind the scenes peek because writing was always an area I was interested in in film and just really didn't know how to get into that that area. So I'm, I'm excited about what you have to share today. And so before we get into those specifics, you guys mind talking a little bit about your time at Grand Valley and what you found valuable there? Sure. You want me to go first? Okay, sure. Um, yeah, so you know, I I think the the biggest things that I remember from Grand Valley that were help, really helpful was I worked on two of the summer film projects, and you know, it's not a you know a perfect representation of an actual Hollywood set, but it's you know similar enough that you understand everyone has their defined roles, and you know, um, you're all working towards a common goal, and the hours were long, and you kind of had it gave me some idea of what to expect when I first got out to LA, and you know, like I said, my first you know, number of years, I was a production assistant on things like 24 and a show called Cold Case. And, you know, I felt like I was able to kind of seamlessly enter those spaces and be somewhat confident that I <laughs> wasn't going to do a horrible thing or, you know, get yelled at. Um, so I think those those experiences on the summer film going from, you know, the very beginning and prep all the way through, I did editing on, on one of them, Flickering Blue. I think the that was a very positive uh, experience for me coming out here. I was able to use those tools. And uh, yeah, I, I think that was the number one thing. You know, I liked my time at Grand Valley. I had a, you know, I had a good four years there. Um, I don't know, that's kind of what I would say to that. How about you, Jeremy? 
Uh, my experience at Grand Valley, it's a little more unique because um, I, out of high school, I'm from Kalamazoo and went to Kalamazoo Valley Community College uh, for two and a half years and then and didn't know what I wanted to do and then was interested in film, but didn't even really realize that there was, you could go to a four-year school and study it uh, until I found out that Grand Valley uh, had a program and it was only an hour away. Um, so I transferred and all, all my KVCC credits transferred, including beginner and intermediate bowling, both those. Uh, <laughs> um, but be because of that, uh, when, once I got to Grand Valley, I got all the prerequisites out of the way and I needed to get three um, film program classes out before I got actually into the program. Um, so once I actually got into the film program, all I had left were film uh, classes to take. And so I was there for like, it's, I feel like it was under a year and the nine months <laughs> lasted through the film program. Um, and then ending on um, with the last three credits I needed was the internship. Um, so uh, I was there briefly, um, but it was great. It was, you learned what you were interested in, what you weren't interested in. Um, and I did not do the, the summer film program. I, I did the internship instead um, because I knew I'd heard and I've heard, heard of a lot of people who would go to Grand go to LA um, and you know not make it. They'd couch there for a little bit, come back, and you know, and that's it's it's hard out here. So I wanted something to come out to. Um, so that's uh, I was fortunate enough with um, a former Grand Valley student named Jason Honeycutt. He uh, had interned at the Young and the Restless and was still out there, um, not on the show, but within the CBS in the same building, and he had. Uh, you know, fortunately reached out to, um, I think it was Deanna Morris, who uh, was my professor, she's the one who said it, um, said if anyone wants, is interested in an internship in LA, let me know. And I was, um, it, it was a, a huge opportunity to have that in with another Grand Valley student. Um, and so I got that internship, but that was my foot in the door. Yeah, I feel like that's so much of how it works. And so my, my experience mirrors George's a bit more where I did the whole, whole shebang at Grand Valley and did the summer film program twice, the first year as a PA, and then the second year as key grip. Um, and just really, again, you know, it's not exactly like being on a film set in LA, but it definitely helps to prepare you for your length of days um, and kind of the amount of work that goes into things. And so I really appreciate having that. And for me also too, it was just about the community aspect. So, you know, most of my very dear friends, um, even met my husband at Grand Valley, um, but just so many of us trickled out to LA. So for me, it was nice. We all kind of came out at different times, but it was nice to have other Grand Valley faces out there that kind of could help get me some work that were already working in the industry as well. And so that was really important for me. Um, and so, yeah, I like hearing your story too, Jeremy, because I wasn't that aware of internship opportunities. So I like that you took that path and that was really helpful for you to get out there and kind of stay out there. Cause I know yeah. that piece can be really tricky if you don't have something in place. Yeah. And, and I, I will add um, a key, when i heard about that Jason was offering this opportunity to at least, you know, send in a resume, I emailed him and, I, you know, I just sent him an email that I guess was professional sounding. And what he told me once I, I had never met him. Um, and once I finally met him out in L.A., he had said that um, a lot of people emailed him like, hey, bro, like, hook me up. <laughs> and he just deleted the email. He didn't respond. He didn't do, you know. Um, so advice to students, take take every opportunity um, serious and uh, and treat it in a professional way because you are even an email, you are kind of, a, it's a first, um, I'm blanking on the word, uh, you know. Uh, impression? Yeah, <laughs> there you go. That's, right. a, that's a great point. I have I have very similar feelings about that because I, you know, being someone who's been out here long enough, I'll get, I'll get emails from people from time to time, current students, you know, or people who've recently graduated and uh, even family friends. And it, the ones that stand out are the ones that take the time to write a nice email and follow through and ask good questions. Like, absolutely. You got to take advantage of, you know, every minor opportunity and connection you can in the best way possible. Yeah. Especially when it's not a face-to-face -face opportunity too, right? So the, the words you use matter, which I feel like mm -hmm. is an important lesson to keep in mind 
from the get-go. So now that we have a sense of where everybody started, um, maybe Jeremy, you can kick us off in talking more specifically about your current project that you're working on and what your role is and maybe a little bit about what your day-to-day -day looks like. Okay, sure. Um, I will, I won't, I'll focus a little bit on this year because the COVID of it was very strange. Um, but typically, so yeah, I'm on Young Sheldon. Um, this is season four. Uh, we actually just recently got picked up for three more seasons, which is wow. uh, crazy. Um, very fortunate. Um, my role, so I'm my title, I'm a co-executive producer, which uh, just, it's basically, I'm still a writer. Uh, if you're a staff writer, the order is staff writer, and George, you can help me out if I'm missing a step. Uh, mm -hmm. Staff writer, story editor, executive story editor, co-producer, yep. producer, supervising producer, co-executive producer, and then executive producer. Um, those are all writers. Um, so if you watch a TV show and those titles are coming up, um, sometimes an editor is a co-EP or a producer, or um, if it says, excuse me, produced by, that's usually the line producer. Um, but generally all those titles are writers on the show and and you being i got very lucky being on the big bang theory which is, it's kind of like shoots and ladders where like i just got on the the, the long ladder um so I, every year i just kept getting um the the title um the bump so uh so i worked my way up to co-ep on big bang and then that's the title i have now on young sheldon um but day to day you know we start the goal we have to write scripts so we uh, obviously we do 22 a season this year we did 18 um and we start about a month and a half or two months before production um and the goal is to have about five or if you can get six scripts that's amazing but you need that buffer um because uh, you production needs scripts and if the worst part is when you're down to the wire and um later in the season and you're just trying to stay ahead with the writing. Um, but we start the season and we do it very unique. Um, this So Chuck Lorre created uh, Big Bang, Two and a Half Men, Young Sheldon and many other shows. And at some point in his career, he decided to just have all the writers in a room writing every script together. So we break a story, uh, which is, you know, everyone pitches story ideas to the showrunner. They, showrunner is like okay i like that one let's talk more about that so you you break it out into scenes um and then you typically other shows uh, which i'm assuming would be george's experience would be um once you have kind of an outline a writer will go write the script and the writer might actually even write the outline and then come back and then as a group you would rewrite it um together uh but we we skip all that we break the story have kind of an outline and then it's fade in um okay we know the first shot is in you know the first scene is going to be in the living room okay who who's all there we know the characters are going to be there but where are they sitting are they sitting on the couch and like we literally that's the the action line and then who speaks first and then we, we literally go through the script um line by line uh together um and then we finish a script and then we do it again, and we do it uh, 22 more times throughout the year. Um, and then once production starts, it gets a little trickier because the showrunner's time is split between you know being on set and in the writer's room. Um, but you know, within eight or nine months, we we write 22 episodes and shoot them. And uh, it's it's uh, we're we're all tired by the end. So it's, um, it's so Jeremy not. Not knowing, I mean, I haven't been in the writer's room for a TV show before, so it sounds, well, one, it sounds like the process you guys use is very collaborative, which sounds yeah. like maybe isn't always true for all TV writing, but in terms of once you guys finish scripts, are you guys just always working on next scripts, or are there writers that then go to set as things are being filmed, if things um, need to be changed, or how does that part of production work? Like, so... Typically, yes. On other shows, the way we work, our showrunner is really hands-on on everything. So we actually, so we have a writer's room in the our office in our office building, and then we actually have two stages where we also have little green rooms that we have turned into writers' rooms. Um, so we do most of our writing on Young Sheldon. This is not the case on Big Bang Theory because a multi-cam format with a live audience is very different from a single camera. Because single camera, you're basically making a movie every week. Um, mm -hmm in multicam you're putting on a play so there's two very very different uh, beasts 
but on Young Sheldon, we are um, on the stage with our showrunner, and we're watching the feed on a monitor on one monitor, which, so we're watching the takes and then we go back to writing on another monitor. Um, and uh, so that's how we operate, but typically other, I mean, every show operates different. Every show runner operates in their own way on whatever works best for them. And some are, some hate going to set and send writers, uh, usually the writer of the script would go to set and cover it just to keep an eye on it. Um, sometimes they have a designated writer who will go to set um, and be there uh, the whole time. Um, and uh, some some showrunners are only on set and have other people run the writer's room. So it's like, it's different every show. Um, but uh, it's, um, yeah, you're, it, it's just a constant, you're constantly, the showrunner himself is, and herself, they're, they're thinking of probably five episodes during a day. Uh, they're either in pre-production on one, a script that's finished, um, the script you're shooting, the script you're writing, um, and then you're editing a script that's already shot. And, you know, and there's probably one more percolating in there also. So like it, it is, um, it's just a constantly moving machine um, where it's uh, it's a lot. <laughs> it sounds like a lot, <laughs> a lot to juggle. Yeah. And so George, maybe you can speak to your current mm -hmm. work and, you know, especially maybe how it's varied a bit from Jeremy's too, or if there are some similarities there. Yeah, so, you know, the bulk of my writing work um, was on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., um, but I've, you know, been in a couple rooms, and, yeah, they sound very different from what Jeremy's describing. I mean, I think the, the ultimate function of it is the same, where you're breaking story and, uh, you know, breaking the season and coming up with the different episodes, but then I would say where it differs in my experience was we did not, in the rooms I've been in, we have we have not written them collaboratively. It's been... You know, you get to a point in the first day or so of breaking the episode where you know it's your episode and then you're kind of leading the discussions and you're the one that stands up and kind of puts those ideas up on the whiteboard. This would be obviously pre-COVID when we were all in a room together. Um, and, you know, like on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., we would get a very detailed outline up on that board. Um, it would start very, very uh, brief, you know, kind of story ideas and they would get more and more firmed up as we went to the point where before I went off to write an episode, I would have every scene in some version up on the board in a very, oh, there's a nice picture of it. Uh, it would look like that. We called that a brick by brick, um, which I think is again, kind of unique to my bosses on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. But the idea would be that you had a, a beginning, a middle and an end for every scene. And you can see the different colors are sort of the different storylines that we're following, the different groups of characters in the episode. Um, I believe this is from a season four episode I wrote as a freelance episode when I was still the writer's assistant. Um, but what was great about something like that, and I, I, you know, if I ever get to run a show, I would like to do something like that because I think it takes a lot of the guesswork out. So the last thing you would do before you would go off to write would be you would stand up there and you would pitch that whole episode out to the entire writer's room and the showrunners and you pause at the end of every act and they give you, you know, detailed notes and feedback. And then you go off by yourself to write the outline. And it was just super helpful to me. I would literally take, you know, the, the writer's assistants always typing up the notes from the room. So I would take literally what you could see on that board would be typed up. I would drop that into an outline and then just fill in the gaps and adjust it as their notes went. And, uh, you know, you, you don't have a lot of guessing. There's not a lot of, um, room for error or, or a lot. Yeah. Uh, it's a lot, it's a nice way to like get into it and you know that most of it's been approved and of course some of it's going to change, but there's not a lot of uh, blowing stories up and starting over, which can happen on, on certain shows. Um, so that, so I'd say that's very different from the way Jeremy described it, but otherwise, uh, you know, it's very, it's very similar in television. The writers are, you know, kind of king. Uh, the showrunner is the, you know, also you could call them the head writer. You know, they're the one that makes all the creative decisions. So whereas on a feature film, you know, you think of movies, you think of the director normally, and they're kind of the ones that get the credit and the, you know, blame and they make all the main decisions. But in, te in television, it really is the writers because they're the, they're the constant forces all the way through the season. A lot of times directors come and go and obviously actors come and go and, um, 
it's a really interesting place to be because you get to see behind the curtain of everything. You get to be a part of all those decisions and it's super, uh, it's super exciting. You know, on my last, on my last show, I was co-producer. So Jeremy, uh, as a, as a co-EP is kind of, you know, very upper level. I would say I'm squarely, you know, mid-level. There's sort of like entry level, mid-level, upper level. Um, so I haven't had some of the, you know, some of the experiences he's had yet, but, um, it's a, it's an exciting job. You know, it's fun to, to be creative and I like working in television because usually you actually get to make it as opposed to, uh, <laughs> features can kind of just be in development forever. Um, and right now I'm not on a show, so I, I'm sort of in a version of that myself. I'm trying to develop a few new ideas and I'm going out and pitching on different projects that are sort of called open writing assignments, you know, where they have a property then they're looking for someone to come in with a strong take and, um, you know, pitch, pitch their take and, and get hired to write it. Let's get hired to write it. So that's a new phase for me. I haven't done that. You know, I've been on shows for, you know, four or five straight years, you know, as a writer. And now I'm kind of in this new phase, which is interesting and frustrating and exciting at the same time. <laughs> very different all, all of the things yeah. so before we move on to the next question it looks like we have a question in the chat that we could touch on because it's kind of relating to what you guys are talking about right now which is you know when you're working on a, a series how do you keep style consistent throughout a season with so many writers and episodes yeah um I, I'll, I'll jump in i i think you know it it all comes down to the showrunner uh because you have writers all the writers in 22 episodes but you also have several other directors coming in um to throw in just another you know someone else in the mix um and it does just come down to the showrunner setting the tone of what the show is um and what the show looks like and it is um you know, I know one of our directors uh, likes coming to Young Sheldon because you can do, you know, we, we have a, a, a tone, but we can kind of mix it up. We can do fantasy. We can do like a, like a fantasy sequence or a dream sequence, which we don't do all the time, but we do, we do do it. Um, and, you know, it's lit a little more... Um, a little more pretty, I guess you could say. Um, so you can kind of have fun with the camera and the, the lighting and stuff. And then that director also worked on other shows where it's very rigid, where you don't, you just, there's a look of the show and you just do it, um, you know, kind of what the, the showrunner wants. But it is, it does really come down to the showrunner um, uh, keeping the consistency and the tone and you know and also the actors are they know their characters very well especially now we're deep into you know the season and so um that kind of keeps it consistent also yeah it's definitely everything jeremy's saying it's the sh you know the showrunner like i said being a part of every decision that's made you know every script even if i go off and write an episode by myself eventually they give you notes or whatever and you give it back to them and they're always going to do their pass too at the end, you know, right before it, it goes out. That's at least been my experience where they're going to do one final pass. So, you know, there's going to be little things that are just specific literally, literally to that person that are just going to make their way into it, you know, little, little style choices or turns of phrase or whatever that, uh, you know, I think it really is it's that more than anything. It's that consistency of leadership and sometimes showrunners change, but, you know, hopefully by that point, yeah, the show sort of can stand on its own. You know, it has its own tone that everyone's used to. The actors, like Jeremy said, are are very familiar with who they are playing. And if the writer writer's room is, in general has any consistency, that becomes like an institutional, just like brain trust. You know, in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., I was there as an assistant to begin with, but as a writer for the back half of the series, you know, I was there the whole time. So I remembered everything. I could remember like, oh yeah, in season two, we had that notes call and they didn't like, et cetera, you know, let's not do that or whatever it was. And so like, you just sort of build this like institutionalized uh, knowledge base that can be really helpful. It's kind of everyone working together, I guess is the, you know, mm -hmm. best way to say mm -hmm. it. Well, great. Thank you for that question, Randy. So now let's move on to the next question. Um, so given, given your current role where you're working today, what would you say you enjoy most about your work and what do you find the most challenging? Um, for, I, 
I enjoy it. So like I, I, I kind of talked about the difference between the multi-cam and the single camera. Um, and I really enjoy the single camera uh, being here on Young Sheldon. Um, I Writing is fun. I also I have been able to um, go in the editing room and help out with the post-production and just kind of help with that. Um, and I really like, <clears throat> excuse me, being on set um, also, because that's where it's being made, where, you know, a joke or a line or, you know, you kind of get it how you want it to be, you know, how, how you heard it when you wrote it. Um, and again, like that still falls on the showrunner, but it, you can also be helpful on that. Or if something's not working, you can pitch another joke or whatever. Um, and then, and actually this season, I was able to direct an episode too, which has been, which is really fun. Um, tons of work and super stressful, but a really good experience. Um, so, you know, the writing allowed me to, to get to that uh, point. Um, but yeah, and it's also just fun to be in a room with other, you know, really great writers who are super funny and, um, uh, you know, spend the day just trying to come up with funny stuff and, you know, and good stuff. And um, it's, it's a fun collaboration. Yeah, my, my favorite part, uh, like I said, I'm not on a show at this moment, but my favorite part kind of of the job is the writer's room. And just, you know, in a normal pre-COVID era, you'd be in that room for, you know, eight to 10 hours a day with the same group of people. And if you like those people, it's awesome because, you know, they're all also like very smart, interesting, funny, creative people who've all led very different lives. And, you know, you start with literally a blank whiteboard at the beginning of a season and at the beginning of an episode and by the end of you know those weeks or several months like you've just you can look back and be like how did we do all of that i don't even remember doing half of it it was so much work but it was so exciting to like just turn nothing in the blue sky phase just you know into like a whole interesting storyline that took place over several episodes like there's i don't know i still get a thrill out of that and it's very exciting and so it sounds like we have a few questions coming in in the chat. So I'll ask the next one. How long does it take to write an entire season? For us doing 22 episodes and on, on the Big Bang Theory, we did actually did 24. It was it was between nine and 10 months to to get it done. Yeah, that was that was similar. Uh... Yeah, on Shield it was very similar. It was we would start in early June and go till April, early April, I think. It was like 10 months, 22 episodes. Um, and then the later seasons we did 13, um, but they were kind of back to back, so it just became like one giant season. <laughs> so it's hard to even say. But uh yeah, that sounds about right. And there's another question, and I'm I'm kind of curious about this too. So like I know what hours are like when you're working on set and you usually have like 12 to 14 to 16 hour days typically. How many hours do you work a week as a writer? What does your day look like? Um, you know, it, I, I think the answer is it probably depends on who your boss is <laughs> <laughs> and what their method is. Uh, you know, I've heard plenty of horror stories about people working, you know, through the night and getting lunch and dinner and breakfast there and never going home and, you know, always being in the office seven days a week. Thankfully, knock on wood, I haven't had to do that yet. I've been uh, on shows that are pretty rigid to, you know, 10 to six, that kind of a day, like with a lunch break, obviously. Um, but yeah, I think it really just depends who your boss is and if they want to stay there as opposed to going home, what their home life is like, they might want not, <laughs> might not want to be there. So it really just depends on a lot of factors. Yeah. How about you, Jeremy? Uh, I'm also about ten to six, and you know, if I'm on set, sometimes we go later, and some, but sometimes we're we're done a little bit earlier on set too. Um, but yeah, it it really does depend on the boss. I've I've been for fairly fortunate, and uh, as, as an assistant at least, um, the hours weren't too bad. Some you know, first year show. If you're on a first year show, those hours are going to be harder because you're figuring out what the show is and you know the, it's that's harder um but uh thankfully both the big bang theory and young sheldon have been about the same thing 10 to 6 sometimes even 10 to 5 10 to 4 it's it, sometimes it's great so yeah that sounds actually really wonderful if, if yeah. you can get that uh, i'll say that's so far from what i would have been used to on film sets and, and we're i think we're pretty lucky for that <laughs> because there are yeah people who like George was saying it's it that is not their experience on um on the show I actually 
on Friends, I guess their writer's hours were terrible. Yeah. And they were shooting at Warner Brothers the same time Everybody Loves Raymond was. And Everybody Loves Raymond, was, they were going home at 4 p.m. every day. And like they would, the Friends writers would just look out and see the Raymond writers going home and being very jealous. Yeah, I heard stories like I've I've heard interviews where they talk, the showrunners talk about that, right? They would like be there all day. She would um, Marta Kaufman said like she would go home to tuck her kids into bed and then go back to work, <laughs> be there till you know the morning. It's like no thanks. Yeah, I don't know. Well, that's nice because it sounds like there's a potential for a work life balance, which is not always the case in some roles in film. So I I like the sound of that. Yeah. Um, so you both talked about interfacing with the showrunner quite a bit. Are there other parts of the crew that you interface with, that you collaborate with at all? Can you speak to that? Yeah, I mean, on so at some point in the process, if you're going to be producing your own episode, you'll interact with everyone. And that's been my experience, you know. Um, when it's when it's an episode that I've written, I'm usually I've been in all the production meetings, which is you know the eight days before you start shooting an episode, you have a different meeting with each department, props or wardrobe or special effects, and so you're it's you know you and, and your boss, the showrunner, it's the director, maybe the line producer with whoever this department head is, and so you're interacting very closely with all of these people, and hopefully in a in a good environment, it's a you know, very collaborative experience where they can say, look, we have this, but this might be too expensive. What if we did this? You know, there's this constant back and forth and sort of troubleshooting uh, where you're trying to solve problems ahead of time. And then again, in, in my experience, you know, being on set for the entire shoot and sitting right there at Video Village with the director and the actors and whoever else, you know, has a question or a concern, like you're just constantly all day long in the middle of the whole process, you know, uh, trying to stay ahead of any potential issues, help help fix any problems, make sure you're getting exactly what your boss wanted. Um, so in a good experience, which has been mine, you're kind of interacting with everyone at some point in the process. Yeah, it's kind of up to each writer, honestly. So I think some writers, they don't, they just want to be in the writer's room. They don't really want to go to set or interact or know how it's made and that's fine but that that is um you know if if you are interested in running a show or even climbing the ladder in kind of any way like it it's really smart i think to go and meet and learn from as many people as you can um to take advantage because you know it's you it's honestly like a film school every single day. If you can, if you work on a show and have access to the set, um, you should take advantage of it. Um, you get to see how everyone works, and you know it's it's only it's only helpful to learn um, uh, what how people work and what they do and what the process is. Um, so yeah, and it's even you know just adding on to that, like as more and more production has left Los Angeles there are plenty of writers who really don't have that experience. You know, they haven't had that opportunity to go to set because it's in Georgia Yeah. and Ooh. you know, shorter seasons, let's say it's a 10 episode Netflix show. They're usually gone before production even starts. So like there are plenty of writers who are mid to upper level who have almost no set experience. So like Jeremy and I, I think have been very lucky that we did, you know, shield filmed here too. And we were right across, you know, right across the walkway from set and we could go there all the time. And I think it's so crucial to like, if you have those opportunities, like he's like Jeremy saying to take them because some, some writers don't have them at all. And then all of a sudden they're a boss and they don't know what a set looks like or how to, you know, how to have those conversations. And it's, it's yeah. a, pro and, a problem. And with me, you know, getting a chance to direct, like, it would have been crazy if it's like, okay, this guy's going to direct. And they're like, who is this guy? You know, <laughs> when I directed everyone, you know, seemed excited and, and, you know, glad I was able to do it and very supportive, which was, you need that when you're directing, uh, you need a crew that is uh, going to have your back. So. I was going to say, you have some rapport going already that you can step into. So that's yeah. probably a nice feeling to have. So there's a couple more questions coming in. And before we segue to one or two of those, I wondered if you could 
each kind of touch on what you find to be the biggest challenges with your role, whether it's in like the day to day or the generation of material, whatever you would like to touch on that way. I, for me, the, um, I think it, it's just the amount of episodes is challenging. Um, Cause you, I'm a little, I mean, I'm very fortunate, but I'm a little like seeing an eight episode season of a show. It's like, wow, that seems kind of nice. Um, because when we write eight, we're only a third of the way through, um, you know, at least on the Big Bang Theory. But it, it is, um, I think it's just that, the keeping that momentum and keeping the energy up. And, you know, there's going to be days when you, you, you're you tired, and um, but you still have to write a script. And, you know, and again, that falls mo mainly on the showrunner. Um, to keep that momentum going and everything, but um, yeah, I would say just the the um, staying consistent for that long is um, it is tiring. How about you, George? Uh, yeah, yeah, I I felt I I uh, can empathize with that quite a bit. You know, those first five seasons of Agents of Shield were uh, twenty two episode seasons, and it's you know you, you at this point in television, you know, it used to be very standalone -y and standalone episodes. And now it's very serialized. And on a show like Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., you know, I think we found that over the course of a season, it was better to almost break it up into like three different groups of about eight episodes for that same reason to keep it manageable. It almost was like individual story pods is how we looked at them. So it was like three separate stories that kind of all tied together in some way, as opposed to one 22 episode story that is kind of impossible to keep track of and and you know keep keep one one upping yourself for for that long um so i think my experience in the in on that show you know i would agree with jeremy and and you know now i'm in this different phase where like i said i'm not on a show at the moment i'm developing and pitching on pitching on some open writing assignments and that's been a whole different learning curve you know i think there's a lot of competition for for these jobs, obviously, and you end up doing a lot of um, basically free work, <laughs> coming up with a take and a pitch, and writing these documents and these slideshows, and doing the song and dance, and you know that's um, that's a whole a whole new world, and I'm still learning uh, how to approach that. You know, I'm speaking to other writers that I know that have done it more than I have, and using those resources, but. Uh, yeah, it's 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 challenging, but you know, when you're on a when you're on a show and it has a room, especially when you're on a network show that has a production date, you know you're going to make these things, and you're just going and going and going. And then I like that because you know you're going to get somewhere. <laughs> and you know, now I'm in a world where it's like, well, will that ever happen? Maybe. You know, this is a really cool idea I've, I've fallen in love with. I hope we get to make this, or, or you know, but you just never know. So I think that. For me personally, at this particular moment, that's sort of what I would say is the challenging aspect of, uh, you know, being a in a freelance uh, industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if we have time later, I would love to talk a little bit about like pilot season and just that finding of work. Um, we have a couple questions coming in that I would like to touch on. Uh, another question from Tariq: Are writers usually paid hourly? An average pay for a staff writer? No, um, it's, you're not. It's not hourly. Once you get your hourly as an assistant, and then and then you get paid a lot more when you get promoted to staff writer. Um, I don't even know what the minimum the staff writer is. Um, at this um, point. Do you know, George? I'm not totally sure either. I know that that's all decided. There are minimums that yeah. are decided by the writers guild. So as a writer, there's a there's a minimum weekly salary that you're allowed to be paid. So the companies can't try to you know lowball you and pay you less. Um, so there, as a staff writer, I'm not sure what it is. It's it's a nice it's a big bump from when you're making that weekly money as an assistant. Um, and then once you get to the next level after um, is story editor is after staff writer. That's like you know your second season as a writer. Usually you get promoted to that, and then there is another increase. Um, in the weekly minimums there, but all that stuff, uh, I'm sure is on the writer's guild website somewhere. You could, I, could look it up. If yeah. I just to guess, it's probably between two and 4,000 because there's like different weeks. It's like a 12 week contract or 16 or 32 and or 40. They, they somehow the guild has mapped it out like that. And then I think the shorter the week, the more you get. So, 
Um, but yeah. it's it's a great chunk of money, especially go, going from assistant to staff writer is um, it's a big big pay bump. Absolutely. All right, and we've got a question from Leah. Is the writer's room typically a competitive environment? Is there any tension between writers as they are all trying to get their ideas, jokes onto the show? It's a great question. It, I'll jump in. It, it's, yeah. it's show by show. It depends on the environment that the showrunner has set. Um, sometimes it's super competitive and super toxic and an awful place. And uh, sometimes it's great. And I, I've had a really good experience uh, where I've been, um, where people are, are supportive. Um, and and honestly, when I'm the Big Bang Theory, especially, and, and still on Young Sheldon, when, when you are doing that many episodes, um, as far as like, like it's oh, it feels great to get a good joke in or a good line or whatever. Like it feels great, um, but also you want to go home. <laughs> so that's <laughs> a great joke. It's like good, I got the joke in. Let's move on. We can keep going to the towards the end of the script. Um, so you know, and sometimes it it does. You know, you're bouncing ideas off, and you know, you can pitch a great joke, and then someone just jumps on top with it even better. Um, but like they might not have gotten that joke without yours, and so you know, so it's like you kind of were had an assist on that one. Um, but yeah, so it, it is room by room. But um, you know, I personally, I think. If it's an environment where everyone's on the same team going for the same goal, um, that is better. And, you know, competition can breed people working harder, but like if it's toxic, then then it's negative and it's not great. So, yeah, you hear plenty of stories about rooms like that, toxic, you know, environments. And obviously there's been a lot of <laughs> articles written about things like that in the last couple of years uh, with certain producers and, and showrunners. But yeah, in my experience, I have not. I have not had that. It's usually been a very collaborative, um, you know, sort of team-based approach to everything. Um, but, you know, I feel like we're saying the same answer a lot, but it kind of really does depend on who your boss is. I mean, it's, you know, it's like any workplace. It, you're the person at the top of the, you know, food chain kind of sets the tone for everybody else. So it really just depends on your showrunner. But so far, you know, knock on wood, I have not encountered very toxic uh, environments. Yeah. I'm wondering, oh, let's, we've got a question from Kim Roberts. Hi, Kim. Um, so let's do this one. And then I have kind of a question about how you guys worked up the ranks a little bit too. So working with young actors and young Sheldon is different from the Big Bang Theory. I imagine your own children have a great influence on writing for Ian and Reagan. How do the writers draw on their own children and teens? Um. Yeah, I mean, I think every, I mean, obviously Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. is a little bit different, but any, mm -hmm. any, mainly a sitcom, like you're drawing from your own life um, uh, a lot. And I mean, this is the Dick Van Dyke show. Carl Reiner told the writers like, okay, go home and then come back and tell us what happened. And that's going to be our episode. And, you know, that's what Phil Rosenthal did. He took that advice from Carl Reiner and that's what he did on Everybody Loves Raymond. So like the writers are, I think you, you're you always drawing from your own lives. Um, to the specific thing with the young actors, like I'm very fortunate where my kids are 13 and 11 and the, um, the, the Sheldon and, and Missy characters on Young Sheldon are in that same range, uh, age range. Um, so it's both good for me as a writer, but it also, it really played in when I directed uh, because I knew I was not phased by, you know, the, these kids, um, they did it, they're, they're excellent actors, but they are, they are kids. So if you say cut, they bounce around and then you got to bring them back and, you know, um, but it definitely helped in directing with them. Um, especially with Ian in the episode I did, uh, he was in every scene except for two or three, I think. So, um, but it made it very easy for me um, to work with him because of, uh, you know, because I have kids that age. So, and, and even one of the crew guys was like, you have kids? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, how old? He's like, okay, I could, I could tell. Um, so, um, so it's very, very helpful um, in that aspect. And that's fun. The kids have informed your work. Mm -hmm. That's great. So I wanted to take a few minutes and maybe talk about, obviously you guys have kind of progressed through the writing ranks to where you are now. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about 
how you learned the ropes as you went. So I, I know you both have some like PA experience in your background, but how did you kind of segue into writing? And then what did that kind of look like as you worked your way up? Uh, yeah, I'll go first. Um, yeah, so when I was, you know, we talked a little bit about being on set and learning from that time. And I think when I was on set as a production assistant from like day one, that's what I was always doing. You know, I was just absorbing. I felt like every day I should learn at least one good thing that I should do and one bad thing that I shouldn't do. You know, and that could mean any, a lot of things. That could be like just watching someone treat someone poorly and be like, okay, well, I never want to do that. Or being on the receiving end of that and knowing, okay, that's not how you treat people. Um, so I think from day one, I was just learning. I was, you know, every day they print out the scenes that you're going to shoot that day on a little piece of, you know, these little smaller sides, they call mm -hmm. them. And I would study those and, you know, try to watch how they blocked that, that scene, how they shot the scene, how the actors perform them. Um, just always trying to learn and ask questions. I think people always liked when you asked questions that showed that you were engaged and you actually cared, you know, in the product uh, that everyone was trying to make, especially when the writers would be visiting set. And so I was able to befriend some of them. Um, and then eventually when I, when I did finally transition off of set into a writer's uh, room on a show called Touch, uh, it was season two of uh, Touch, it was on Fox, it was a Kiefer Sutherland show. And that was just, I was a, then a, a writer's PA, which was, you know, very different. I wasn't on set during filming. Instead, I was in the writer's room uh, offices, answering the phone, copy, you know, making copies, getting coffees, uh, getting lunches, that kind of thing. But again, I tried to approach it the same way where now I was actually working with, you know, the 10 or so writers on that show on a day-to-day -day basis and eating lunch with them. And so I, I approached it the exact same way. I took every script and I underlined things and I would ask questions like, why did we make that choice? Or, or uh, did we, you know, what does this mean? Or, or why, why is that happening? And just by showing that you're kind of inquisitive and interested and being open about, you know, your own ambitions, that that's what you would like to do as your career. I think people can tell when you're doing a good job and you're engaged and then they want to help you along your journey. So, you know, with that one experience as a writer's PA on that show touch, uh, you know, one of those writers, her name is Karen Usher. She was at that time writing a pilot for Fox and they greenlit the pilot. So at the end of the season, uh, the exact same day, my last day on the season, she called me and said, Hey, I just got my pilot picked up. Do you want to come be my assistant? So then I was, you know, basically working with, with her, on a pilot, which I had never done before, you know, and that was the next several months. And then that led almost right away into Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. And I think it's just so important at every step of the way to, to do a really good job, ask questions, you know, um, show that you're interested and engaged and can be, you know, useful. You, number one, you have to do your job really well. And, you know, you just, you can't help but befriend these people. If they're nice people, you know, they can see that you're working really hard, they wanna help you. So. You know, Karen uh, was one of my early mentors. And then when I got onto Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., you know, the showrunners there and the other up, upper level writers, you know, eventually you just form those relationships. Uh, you're around them all the time. You become friends, you know, about their personal life. And, you know, you know the day to day of what we're all going through. And as long as you're all sort of working together, you can't help but sort of form, you know, mentorships with different people. Yeah, I love that. And the whole idea of kind of helping people up along behind you too. So I'm, I'm happy that you touched on kind of like that mentor role as well. And how about you, Jeremy? Um, yeah, I mean, honestly, again, similar. Uh, yeah. I will just add on top of working hard and being inquisitive, uh, just be nice. Being yeah. nice goes a long way. Um, and because people will want to keep working with you. And it's, it's the same thing. So I was a PA on one show. Um, and then a friend, unrelated, got me a writer's PA job on the show called The Game and rose the ranks, but, um, and told the, you know, everyone knew I wanted to be a writer. So when a writer's assistant job opened up in season two of that, I was able to get into that room because because they liked me. And um, and I got fortunate. Uh, I mean, one of the assistants threw his back out. So for a week, I got thrown in um, in the writer's assistant job in the room um, as a PA. Uh, so literally getting thrown in. And and, and then uh, the next season when that same writer got promoted, um, they, they let me be the assistant. It was a pretty smooth transition. Um, and then I 
got on another show because the first show I was on was a writer um, who was really nice and he liked me, I liked him. He had a pilot and so I worked with him very uh, easily. And you know, it's just, once you start meeting people and meeting writers, um, it is, it, it, it's, I, I haven't used a resume in probably 15 years <laughs> because it's all relationship. It's all people you know. Um, and you know, when I got, I was actually out of work for a year and needed a job. And on the Big Bang Theory, they, a friend of a friend, it was the new, someone needed an assistant to fill in and it was like, oh, are you working? You know, so it's all just connections. It's all connections. Um, and I will say it's different in TV because the writers hire writers, the, the showrunners hire writers. So um, unlike film where, you know, it's studios and, and producers hiring the writers. So um, if you get to know like a, a relationship with a showrunner is probably the most valuable relationship you can have if you want to be a writer because um, they, they do the hiring. Um, and I will, if you can, it's a hard job to get, but the writer's assistant job is invaluable in learning how to write because you your job is you, you're typing the script, um, you're taking the notes, but you're also in a room with 10 other writers or 10 writers, professional, really good at their job, and you're seeing how they make TV and you can't help but soak it in. So, um, so that was a huge experience for me being on the Big Bang Theory for two years as an assistant was... It, you know, because they operated in such a different way, um, I had two years to absorb that and to see how they worked and kind of start to pitch jokes. And so by the time I became a staff writer, it was a very smooth transition, both for me, but also for everyone else, because I was already in that room for two years. Um, so, yeah. It's so much about connections, which is something I try to really let students know. And I'm also glad because it sounds like really basic advice, the whole idea of being nice to people. Um, but it, when you live in LA and you work in these spaces, you realize that that's not always common practice. And so it, it sounds very simple. Um, but I remember as a casting assistant talking to people on the phone, and I don't know how many times people would say, you're the nicest casting assistant I've ever talked to because you're taking the time to answer my questions. And I thought, you know, isn't that a basic request of my job? But, you know, not not everyone takes the time to be nice. And so I, I feel like that does truly stand out in LA, especially, and people notice that, especially if it's a genuine. So I'm glad that you both touched on that too. So our final question for today is, what advice do you have for students that want to be writers for TV? Um, I'll go first, I guess. Um, you know, I, I think I get asked that question a lot, right? By people that would like to be writers and especially people from Michigan or other places that this, this LA thing just seems so vague and mysterious to, um, you know, I think the, the number one thing, and people always said this to me is like, you have to be writing, you know, if you want to write, you have to write, which is okay. That sounds confusing and like a catch 22, but the, the truth to that is, you know, you, you do, you have to have at least one really, really good script. If you wanna become a writer, someone's gonna to wanna to read you. And if it's not very good, they're probably not gonna to wanna to hire you regardless of whether or not they like you or you're nice or anything else. So I think it's important to you know pick pick sort of what you'd like to do if you wanna write comedies, write a comedy or, or drama, write, write a drama. But you know now what's so exciting is you can find examples from almost any show or movie you can find the scripts online and i encourage people to you know pick pick the thing that they love the most that that's what they want to write and you know find the script and read it a couple times see what works watch watch the movie or show again see how certain moments on the page translated to the screen you know like really break it down and study it and and do your best to figure out what makes certain things work and really put in your own work. It takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of revisions. You know, your first draft of anything is not gonna be the thing that's gonna get you hired. It's gonna take you many drafts and, and probably many scripts to really figure out how to do this thing. It's, it's tricky. Um, so I think craft-wise, you just always have to be reading and, and writing and rewriting. Uh, I always recommend certain, there's a lot of writers' podcasts. Uh, there's one called Script Notes. There's one called the Writers Panel. These are like invaluable free resources where you can hear actual writers answering questions and talking about their process and how they broke in and 
Um, those are very good resources, even from Michigan that you can be working on all the time. And when you come out to LA, you know, it's really just a matter of finding your people. It's um, finding other people that are trying to break in and, you know, maybe form a writer's group, uh, try and get an internship, just do anything and any, anything at all you can possibly think of. Reach out to any alumni of, of Grand Valley that you can or any random friend of a friend of a friend and just do your best to be kind to everyone, you know, put out there what you want and just stay focused on it. It's very easy to get distracted or busy doing other things and not, um, you know, end up where you want to be. I'm, I'm glad you went first. Cause I don't, I don't really have any, <laughs> um, Fair. Other, other than, you know, I, like George, eventually you will need to move either to LA or, you know, things are shooting in Atlanta. Love it. Even those, those things are usually written in Los Angeles. Um, and it's different for everyone, how they become a writer. Um, but I do think even, you know, that the two people on this panel who went to Grand Valley, like the, the path was almost identical of assistant to writers, assistant to uh, staff writer. Um, I think that is the most common, um, but even though our journey to get those jobs were different um, and if you move out, it will be different for you too. Um, but, you know, I think you do, it is, you kind of need to be here. Um, and you need patience. I don't know how long it took you, George, to get your first writing job, but I was out here 11 years. Uh -huh. um, so it is, it is not going to happen overnight. Um, but you do need uh, uh, patience and, you know, and it's also, I, I will say, um, you know, it is important to know and you kind of, you might not know until it happens, but like the writing job is not going to, um, fulfill everything you know it's a dream job and you get it um but it is important to have a a life and to know that that this is not gonna you know satisfy everything and um i was lucky enough when i got promoted i was i think 33 and my grandpa had just passed away and, and he was 94 and so i was like okay this is a big deal to be a writer on the big bang theory but like i might live another 61 years so like this can't be everything um, but, uh, you know, obviously chase it and do it, but, um, but have a balanced life also. Yeah, that, that's great advice, Jeremy. Yeah. Mine, I mean, we're so eerily similar. Mine, I, I had written a couple of freelance episodes, but my staff writer job, full-time staff writer job was 12 years okay. since, I'd, yeah. since I'd moved to LA. So very similar. Right. Well, I appreciate you both touching on that too, because I know sometimes there's this perception that things can happen so quickly, but it is so much about being there, soaking in the knowledge, you know, waiting for the opportunity, showing that you're willing to work hard and those things don't necessarily all happen overnight. And so I, I appreciate getting the timeline of it too, because it, it really helps to give students, especially kind of like a frame of reference for what that might look like. So we're just about out of time. I'm really happy both of you could join me. I feel like I have about 100 more questions I could ask both of you. So I, I don't know, maybe we can do this again sometime. But I'm wondering if either of you have any final thoughts before we wrap. Hmm. I, Jer Jeremy? <laughs> yeah, sure. yeah, to touch on it. You know, I think it, it it's um, easy to see people who are further along than you um, but like in my experience, you know, I, I feel like I was always only, I was good enough for the job I was at the, at the time. Um, so like when I, I was good enough to be an assistant, um, I had enough assistant experience to, when I got to the Big Bang Theory, last on the Big Bang Theory, because it was, it was a, a tricky room as an assistant to be in, but because I had some experience, I was able to last. Um, and then when I got promoted to staff writer, I was good enough to be a staff writer. And then as everything kind of came along, um, and I, I don't know if I was good enough as a director, um, but it, it happened. Um, but I, it couldn't have happened sooner. I needed to like be on the show for that long and to kind of, you know, be prepared for that moment. Um, and so, and I'm still just like, like I'm, I don't honestly, I don't think I'm ready to run a show, but like maybe one day I will be. Um, just you know, gaining that experience. So um, that that popped into my head when you were talking. So I I don't know if the, those are good final statements, but um, that just popped into my head. No, that's great. I love that, George. Any final words before we say goodbye? Um, yeah, I mean, all that makes a lot of sense. You know, I think 
I think I said this before, but from the very beginning, I tried to just absorb as much information and knowledge and experience from other people as I could along the way. And I still am, you know, doing that even now. Um, I think that's all really helpful. And yeah, it's very easy to read a press release for someone who just sold a script for a million dollars and they're 24 years old and get very frustrated, you know, especially for me now as like someone in my late thirties, even you see things like that and you're like, what the heck, you know, why, why, why so fast? What happened? Um, you know, but, but the reality is look at Jeremy and I, it took us 11 and 12 years to become full-time writers, you know, and even now, you know, I'm between shows and I'm chasing the next one. You're always, you're always, it's a, it's a job and a life where you're always kind of working hard and chasing what's next. It's very rare that, uh, you know, you know where you're going to be working uh, a year or two years down the line. So it's definitely a job that's awesome and rewarding and everything you want it to be, but you know, it's, it is a lot of work and you have to be ready to kind of put in the time and effort to make that um, happen. Well, great. Thank you both for joining us today and uh, best wishes on current and next projects. Thank you. Thank you. Nice talking to you guys. Yeah.